it. Sorry about that. Okay, Molly, take it away. Yay, well, thank you for having me and thank you for that amazing introduction. You're so good. Um, I'm excited to be here. And yes, I when Shannon said, can you talk about oils and animals? I'm like, of course, I love this topic. I use it. I use these products on my animals every single day. So it was an easy yes. So thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. And um, so a little bit of a setup, and then I'm going to dig right in really hard because this is a very controversial topic and I'm just going to kind of rip the bandaid off. So um, I'm not a vet, even though I do have some medical background in my, um, in my expertise, I am not a licensed vet by any means. So anything that you hear, if it makes you uncomfortable, feel free to take it back to your vet. Anything that I share are my personal testimonies with my animals or family animals. And, um, you know, like take them for, take them for the stories that they are and, you know, just hear, hear my experiences. Um, and it's, and know that it's, it's pure goodness. So, um, I, I want to say that every time I hear about oils and animals, I hear so much so often about this fear that comes up and we don't need to be fearful about using young living products with our animals. Here is the biggest thing. It's the quality, you guys, when you want to combine the topic of animals and the topic of oils together, if you are using Young Living products, you don't have to worry anymore. Um, so I will say that I was introduced to Young Living about 12 years ago, and it was because of my horses. So I have horses. I have been into um, animals my entire life. I was raised on like a hobby farm where we did 4-H animals and we always had horses and we had chickens. And so I was, I, I was grow, I grew up as this farm kid. So it's, it's very much, you know, part of who I am. Um, and you know, when I was introduced to young living, I was already very handy with animals. So if you've ever had animals, you know, that they get hurt and things come up and you just naturally become a little bit more wherewithal with injuries and blood and, you know, the things that come along with animals. And, um, so when I was introduced to the oils, I was traveling with my horses a lot. And I was so excited to have just like tools in my toolbox because we were traveling all over the country at that point. And we were, what we were, we were putting on demonstrations to people. And sometimes we would be places where, you know, you didn't have your normal vet horses could, you know, get in tight situations around stress and whatnot. And so it was great to just have tools in your toolbox that you knew that you could lean on if you couldn't get to a vet, or if you just needed something instantaneously, or just to make you feel better until a vet could arrive. So, um, I have such a connection and a positive, um, connotation with my oils and animals. I, I was actually shocked when like, and I'm just, like I said, I'm going to put this right out there there. You know, you can go and be careful what you Google because you can go out there and people are going to be like, Oh, never use an oil with an animal, blah, 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 fill in the blank. Well, I'm here to tell you it's hogwash and it's going to come back to quality. And the, th the stories I'm going to tell you tonight, you're probably going to be like, you know, you're gonna have to lift your chin off the floor because you might not have ever thought to do this or know anybody that has done this. And um, I just want to give you the empowerment and this license to learn and the permission to experiment with this because I can guarantee you that, you know, in traditionalsville where, you know, you go to a veterinarian and all out of goodness of your heart and goodness of their heart, like I do believe that no veterinarian wakes up and wants to like, do any harm to our animals. But, you know, when we look at the ingredients that are in um, vaccines and wormer and anesthesia, and we compare that to an essential oil that is a plant that has never had a GMO or a pesticide or any toxin touching it, it's like, you can't even compare that. And so, you know, it's, it's this whole mindset, you guys. And I, I want to give you the confidence. I want to help you remove this, this layer of fear around oils and animals and just allow yourself to experiment. So with that being said, I would love to just tell you some stories and of things that I use of different things that have come up with my animals and my, some of my family animals and tell you how we did this. Um, so the first story I will tell you about is, um, 
my horse Reese, uh, recently in the last couple of years, you know, if you're a horse owner, you know, that horses are very curious. And if you've ever been around horse people, it's like horses look for things to get injured on. Now my, I've lived at my current house for 10 years. So he's been in the same pasture that whole time. He like came in the barn and had this slice, literally probably like this long down his nose. And I like lifted up his forelock, which is like the front of his mane. And in like two seconds, I'm like, yep, that's going to need stitches. And so I call the vet out because I, you know, there, there's some things that, you know, I've fixed with oils without stitches, but sometimes you just know that it's like, okay, I need the extra guns here. So I worked collaboratively with my vet. And as she is um, working on the stitches, I'm standing over her on a bucket higher than my horse, dropping frankincense and helichrysum into his wound line right in while she's stitching. And I, she was probably like, Oh my gosh, but guess what? It's my horse. I had the confidence. I had the wherewithal. And I followed up with that. I, you know, when the stitches are super, super fresh, you don't want to necessarily really get too involved. Um, cause it can loosen the skin and whatnot. But, um, you know, I was putting in, uh, I was putting frankincense and helichrysum all around the wound. And then as soon as I got those stitches out, I was going heavy on animal sense ointment and, uh, frankincense and helichrysum. And I'm telling you guys, um, it healed incredibly. I mean, unless you took a razor blade to his hair, you cannot even see a scar or like where the, um, the hair grew differently because the oils were so healing. So I use frankincense and helichrysum super, super healing. Um, and I actually have, I can send this to you. Um, let me see. I can, I wonder if I can put it in the chat, but I actually have a file. That's a barn file that I recommend like oils that you definitely like if you have barn animals or if you have animals in general, I have a list of oils that you absolutely like want to have on hand. Frankincense and helichrysum are, um, and the animal sense ointment are hundred percent. Yes. While we're on the topic of animal sense ointment, if you, does anybody use that and love that? not just for your animals, like your cuticles, your heels, like any cut, scrape, boo-boo you have, animal sense ointment's awesome, right? Yes. So um, when you get it, the jar is kind of um, hard. It used to be like this luscious, gooey ointment. And then when they, um, when they kind of upgraded the, um, to be vegan friendly, it's kind of like a hard because they went to a plant oil in there, uh, carrier oil. So here's a tip for you. Take the lid off and you can either take it out of the thing and put it in a bowl and take your kitchen hand mixer and whip that baby up and then put it back in the jar or whip it right in the jar it stays luscious and whippy and it is so much easier to apply. So if you, if you have, have gotten that and then you've been like, this sucker is so hard I'll whip it up and you, it will be a life changer for you. So yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So that is my tip about stitches. And also it, I will, I want to tell you about stitches also, whether it's on a human or a horse or whatever you got stitches going on. Um, when you are using natural modalities, because typically we have the wherewithal to boost the immune system when you have an injury and then you're using those oils, most um, practitioners, surgeons are leaving those stitches in for a week to 10 days. I am here to tell you that you, when you are doing it naturally, you usually only need those stitches around the five day mark. After that, you're kind of getting some regression. So I want to just point that out from a natural perspective as a tip that, you know, when you use the natural things, you heal so much faster. And so you have to have that cognitive um, awareness and observation just to like watch those things. So, cause then you'll actually get a better healing overall. Like I don't think I've ever um, had a vet back to take the stitches out. I'm, I have, I bought my own, you know, stitch remover scissors and good to go. So there's a tip for you too. Okay. So my brother's dog, have you ever seen a dog that has like, gets like those eye things on it and like the dog that you take them to the vet and they want to, um, you spend a whole bunch of money to like remove those. And it's kind of, um, it can be abrasive because they put them under anesthesia and whatnot. So we took, um, sacred frankincense and frankincense and, um, animal sense ointment. And it was right by his eye and we rubbed his little eye. He had a big old growth, probably about the size of like two peas together, maybe like a small olive. It was big. And so, and it was like pushing his eye like this. And so we rubbed that every single day. And on the fifth day it fell off. 
yeah, it was cool. I do have pictures of that. So I was just scrolling through my 20,000 pictures on my phone and not finding them fast today, but I have pictures of that. Um, okay, my sister's cat. And here's what I wanna tell you about cats. And with any animals, if you are new to bringing oils into your home, just a simple rule of thumb, set up your diffuser with your favorite oils, whatever it's going to be, and put it in an area that your cat or your dog can get away from it if you're worried about it. You would, I mean, you would have to literally plan to poison your pet to have this go wrong. Okay. The animals that have issues, they have already had issues. And they're, and if, if anybody has ever tell, told you that their, their eyes, their, their cat or their dog's getting weepy eyes or something's like happening because of the oils, like that could, could be like the oils could be present while that's happening, but more than likely it's because your dog is, um, ever Googled vaccinosis in dogs. It's this really weird thing. You can literally talk about dogs getting too many vaccines and having a world of problems. You can't talk about that with anything else, but it's out there with dogs. Just so you know, there's this whole thing called vaccinosis where they over vaccinate them. And now the world's like catching up and like starting to talk about that a little bit. So, um, but dogs get over vaccinated, dogs get overwormed, dogs get over, um, uh, flea treatments. Like and your constitution, which is like, you know, the way your body processes and works all in, in symbiosis together, um, can only handle so much, you know, and they can have like an autoimmune kind of response. They can look like they're having an allergic reaction, but the fact of the matter is their bodies are maxed out. And so if for some reason you introduce oils to, and your pet is in the vicinity, more than likely you have a bigger problem than oils in your house you know, looking into detoxing your home. How do I detox my pet? How do I increase your immune system? Can I look at a raw diet? I mean, on and on and on, like peeling back the layers of actually helping your animal's health. The oils might've just shown up and said, oh my gosh, like, hey, this is the first time that something has been offered to my body where I can like release some junk, okay? So it's a mindset shift, you guys. This is not, this is not about the oils. Um, we have several veterinarians on our team, my um, upline and my big, you know, young living family, very, very animal, very, very oily, very, very oily animal. They have stood in surgery rooms and held intestines and organs in their hands with oils in their hands. Okay. And like saved animals lives. They, the only oil that veterinarians tend to just proceed with caution on with, with cats, especially is wintergreen because it's a blood thinner because it can add at like a, a aspirin, which, you know, cats in general are not, don't do well with. Um, but for the most part, there's not really, um, you know, all this hogwash about tea tree and eucalyptus. It's like people, I am here to tell you, I would have killed my animals by now. I would have killed my animals by now because I didn't even know that oils were toxic until like the last recent few years where people wanted to start talking about that. You know, it's like, you know, you can't believe everything you Google and you can't believe everything that people are talking about. So, um, you know, we have so many, we have a ton of vets that actually, you know, use them in daily practice for the, for the dogs and cats, especially we have, um, some people who actually use them in rescues where it's just very commonplace, very mainstream for them to do that. It's like, it, you know, for them, it's normal. Um, for the rest of the world, it's like, we have to bring them up to speed. And I can't reiterate enough that these are plants and they are so healing and, and used in a commonsensical way, you're going to have amazing results. Okay. Um, next thing I will tell you about is my sister's cat. Um, she is about 15 or 16. And she called me around Christmas and was like, the cat's not eating. She's like basically falling over. I don't know if she like got into, she, she is very much in, like I rescued her off of a farm, gave her to my sister. She's been an indoor outdoor cat at, they've lived like, um, kind of like suburbia. So she's like gone in and out her whole life and like such an outdoor cat catches all the things super healthy. Um, and she's like, 
I don't know, the cat's like done, you know, she's like flopped over here, super lethargic, you know, and I'm like, okay, great. Like, let's think this through. You go to the vet, you know, they're probably going to suggest X, Y, and Z, um, you know, and, and maybe it's going to work or maybe it's not going to work. And if you've ever had a sick cat, you know, that's very challenging to treat a cat. You know, it's like, they don't really like to be treated. They don't really want you to touch your mouth. They don't really, even the nicest, cuddliest cats are kind of like, not with the BS, you know, they're like, stop touching me. And so, you know, we were just like, okay, great. Let's start loading her up because either she's going to die or we're going to take her to the vet and it might be too much, or they're going to like load her up with all these drugs. And that's just not the path we were wanting to go down. And so my sister started, um, she was like not eating, not drinking, nothing. And this is the cat that like my sister starts cooking food and she like shows up at the, in the kitchen, like give me something and drinks out of the sink and the whole thing. And so she starts just like putting on her hands eucalyptus because her breathing was kind of bad. If you've ever noticed cats, like their respiratory, like takes the hit right away. Um, so she started putting eucalyptus on her hands. She started putting um, frankincense on, she was putting, um, purification on, and she was just putting that in her hands. And so a good, a good tip is like, you can put oils on your hands, rub them, rub them in and then wipe them on. Um, and sometimes just rubbing them into you, like we'll give them a lesser dose, but what do cats do? They lick, right? So if you put it on your hands and you put it on their, on them, they will have to lick it off. And so we did this for, it's like, how long can she go without eating? I don't know. So we're like, we're just going to try anything. So we took, um, we made like a little paste with Ningxia and life nine and we painted that on her paws. We, um, and we just kept offering her these things like, and after about a week, almost a week, like she, the, the, the day after she perked up, she was like less lethargic. And after about a week, she started drinking bone broth and she started like, she wouldn't eat tuna. Like we pulled out all the stops. Like I even had my sister go and get her like a stinky can of cat food, like anything you want, lady, like, let's try to get something into you. And, um, you know, she was not having it and, you know, slowly, but surely she got her appetite back. You know, her eyes cleared up, her respiratory cleared up. She started, she was drinking like tons of bone broth. This cat rallied back, this cat rallied back. And I mean, you would not, and if oils can kill cats, which I believe the junkie oils, you know, there might be some validity to that. <laughs> um, but if young living oils can kill cats, it did not happen in the, with this incident. And I mean, we were using so many drops and so much oil on this cat. She, a month later took her for blood work because it was, you know, during COVID time. So if it was not an emergency, it was kind of like hard to get in. And so, um, took her for a month later for blood work and on this 15, 16 year old cat. And the vet's like, the blood work on this cat is a little unbelievable. <laughs> and where they're like, we thought we swapped the blood work for a minute because this is unbelievable. And they're just like, she seems good. Like continue doing what you're doing, <gasps> you know? So have faith, you guys. It's like, it's okay for somebody to give you a caution flag and maybe like bring up the fear flag. But I, want to really encourage you to just like pump the brakes and, and call on your thinking mind, call a friend who's maybe been there, done that. And I promise you just based on my experiences that you can do this. If you want to use oils with your animals, you absolutely can. Okay. Um, next story I have for you is my, anybody have questions about any of that before I keep going and you can throw them in the chat too, and I can catch them there. You said real quickly the Ningxia Red and Life Nine paste, I think. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah. So I just, I literally had her open up a capsule of, of Life Nine and like put a little Ningxia Red in it and make a little paste out of it and then put that on her um, little paws, you know, so she could clean it. And then she was giving her like a dropper, like taking a dropper and feeding her Ningxia with that until she was like wanting to eat herself you know, animal people figure out, figure it out. <laughs> um, okay. Jump in, please feel free to jump in if you guys have questions. Okay. The next one I'll tell you about is my, um, like I said, we're country people. Okay. So my nephews are, were, are in, we're in 4-H. He called me SOS. He was probably 14 at this time, has a steer that he's going to be showing at the fair, this cow. And he's like, 
okay, Aunt Molly, my steer can't walk. I'm supposed to show it. I'm supposed to sell it. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Like it's uncomfortable. It's in pain. I can't give it any drugs because if it, if I give it drugs and I can't sell it, da, 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 you know, the whole thing. And I'm like, okay, here we go. So, um, I actually gave this cow a raindrop at the fair. It's all weighed in and everything. So I gave this cow a raindrop and I took oils like Copaiba and Panaway. Um, and I, um, just like put it all over where the pain was presenting. I mean, it's a cow. It's not like super, um, they're more, uh, what's the word? Um, you know, there's, it's not as easy to read lameness as like on, on horses and dogs and things like that. They're a little bit more stoic. Um, and so, and I, I gave this thing a ton of digize and peppermint and offered it some sea salt, some plain water, some sea salt water and some molasses in the water. And I kid you not, like we had like a four day window to get through and we just kept going on this protocol and this cow was sound. He won some ribbons in his classes and he was able to sell the thing. And he was like, you know, cause they have them for like a year. It was like, praise Jesus, <laughs> get this thing out the door. I don't care what happens to you after that, because you're going in the freezer after that. Like I said, we're farm people, very realistic. Okay. So, but I mean, how cool was that? Like his year long project could have been tanked if he would have had to bring in, you know, butte, which is a high dose aspirin um, thing or any kind of a pain med or any kind of a, um, steroid or anything that would have been a conventional veterinary procedure, but we were able to have this, this animal be comfortable and out of, you know, out of visible pain and eating and drinking and healthy. And he was able to do it. So that was pretty awesome to, you know, have these cool, um, things to lean on. So do I have a natural dewormer for horses? I do. Um, first of all, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, Julia, the kitty is still on Ningxia. Yes. And then, um, the, she just gets a little bit in her water just, um, and it does good with it. So, um, first of all, I, uh, the topic of worms, I try very hard to create an environment in people, um, dogs, horses, cats, so that worms don't want to live there. So the truth is we all have some level of parasites. It's part of our, our ecology. Is that the word? Like our DNA, like it's part of our makeup to have parasites. It's just, it's in us. Um, and so what I do is, you know, for my, my dogs, they get a raw diet. I give them Ningxia. I give them different supplements, um, you know, to make sure that, so where worms, parasites cannot live where oxygen is present. So if your body is healthy, this is for people, horses, whatever, if there's oxygen flowing through the body, which we know our oils are very oxygenating, then worms technically, and like if you did this under a microscope, cannot live. And so, you know, before you have worms, you are going to see a host of other problems. Like you are going to see um, parasite issues in the condition of your horses and the condition of your dogs, the way they want to eat their energy level. Um, you're going to see a lot more things. We are just not trained to look for these things. And so, um, for horses, um, I do not, I actually make my own horse feed, um, and it's made out of whole grains. So I don't feed pellets because I believe when things go through, I think of pellets like a TV dinner. Do, do those even exist anymore? Like something you like pop in the microwave, you know? There's no nutrition in that, you guys, nothing. Like you're eating a food-like thing. That's not food, that's not nutrition, that's a food-like thing. You chew it up, it tastes like salt or something, it has texture, it goes in your body, it fills a void and you poop it out. And I don't know what else you do with it. So that's the same way I feel about kibble for dogs, kibble for cats and, and, um, and pellets for horses. And so, um, I suggest making your own, reaching out to me. There are a few other, there are a few like whole grain, um, if any of you have grandpas that had, had farms, they will tell you, their dog, their farm dog was the healthiest darn thing I that ever lived, like eight table scraps and like never saw the vet, had lots of exercise, lots of energy, very little um, chemical burden from mainstream, right? Like maybe the farm vet saw it every now and again. Um, 
there's some, there's something to take note about there. The horses, the way farmers used to feed their horses was the cows ate first, right? They ate the best of everything um, because they needed, they were producing milk to sh- to sell. So like back in the day, you know, you go down, um, you know, little farm USA and you see about every mile a farm and they would have about 80 to hundred cows and that would be their, their um, family dairy farm. And they had, you know, their hundred acres or whatever it was. And then um, they had a few horses to do farm work and whatnot. And the cows ate first because they were producing the milk. Cause that was paying the, 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 you know, paying the family wages. And then the horses ate the rest of everything. So it was like the stockier, less protein filled, easier going, um, you know, um, forages. And you know, the horses back then ate like a handful of oats and the leftover hays and grasses, simple diets. There was no insulin resistance. There was no metabolic problems with these horses. There was like the cases of founders back in the day was like, low. I mean, you guys, like we, the vaccine load, the worming load did not exist back then. And those horses worked harder than most horses these days those horses worked harder than most horses these days. Okay. So there's something to take note about there. Am I saying that we have to do exactly that? No, of course not. Of course, we're going to grow and change and learn and all that, but there's something to take note there. So, um, I do believe in, there's so many options out there and what's available in your area is going to, um, help you navigate there that, Um, those topics, but getting back to whole foods, whole ingredients is going to help you um, keep a a better gut state for your horses. So I believe in probiotics. I believe in, um, you know, keeping it simple for your horses and therefore you will have less of a worm load. I have not chemically wormed my horses in close to 20 years now. And um, for a long time, I, here's another story on that. So when I was first showing, this is like, you know, 20 years ago plus I was um I got in the mail a, a DVD with this guy showing in raining and talking about this product called Strongid C. It was a daily wormer. And if you fed this daily wormer and your horse colic, which is like a super bad stomach ache, their gut can turn, oftentimes they need surgery, super expensive, very bad, lots of death, trauma, the whole thing, they would pay for your horse's colic care, okay? And fast forward, they realized what they did by feeding warmer every single day was actually cause resistance to the parasites. And it was like a bigger problem than ever. And so what they realized instead of like, instead of like overwarming, cause it, they, you know, there's, there's a school of thoughts like, oh, just warm your horse every month and you, you know, you got them or just, you know, and then there was like this daily warming thing. And then they realize, oh my gosh, like we're overdoing it. Now it's like, we've created this worse problem. And so then, so now most vets like that are clued into this, will have you take a fecal sample and they'll actually, you know, look at the strong goals, strong guiles, and like tell you how much of whatever. I don't like that method because you could take a poop from the morning and you could take a poop from the night or the next or later in the week and you could get vastly different results. So there's that. Um, I also, you know, stopped even testing my horses because the the levels were so low that it was like, what's the point here? And, um, and if I ever had an issue, I would use, um, you know, feeding Ningxia Red, the Ningxia Red packets is awesome, but I would use things like Akatea. I would use things like the Parafree. Um, you know, we have these products following that up with, you know, you could use Detoxime. I've used the same warming protocols on my son when all of a sudden he had a bedwetting thing out of, out of nowhere. And I, I researched that there was a um, parasite connection to bedwetting and I did paraphrase and detox sign and lo and behold, that went away. So there you go. You can use that same protocol. I got a puppy recently and she threw up roundworms in the middle of the night. And I was like, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever have seen. And <laughs> I gave her um, digize and detox sign and um, kept her on paraphrase and no more worms. You guys, we have super incredible products. We have super incredible products. You just have to have the lack of fear and the desire 
to play with them and make them work for you because they are awesome. Okay, um, questions on that? I'm gonna tell you another story. Okay, um, so I had, so my, so I've raised Vishlas. We're on our third little Vishla dog. We love the breed Vishla. And um, they typically have a lifespan of like 12 to 16. And, and my male Vishla, and I've had a couple of litters of puppies and, um, you know, done lots of research. And he had like all the health screenings and like super healthy. Um, he was nine last year. And all of a sudden he was having some issues. Uh, like kind of out of the blue and was like very sore in his neck and like lots of things um, happening with him. And um, I, oh, for the puppy, I did the paraphrase, digize and detox time. And I kept it up for a month. Um, another rule of thumb is to do when you want to do natural wormers is time it around the full moon because that's when they like to move to the inside of the intestines for breeding. Disgusting, but true. Okay. So my, um, we figured out that my dog actually had a lesion on his um, spinal cord. So it was pretty much irreversible, nothing that we could do on it. Very, very sad. Um, for four, for three weeks, he was actually just showing pain, pain symptoms, even though I was like using Copaiba and um, Sulfurzyme and I was giving him BLM and Agilis and I was doing all these kinds of things to help you know, mitigate his pain levels. And if it's truly a pain issue, our stuff can knock it out. You know, like if I, if my dogs go running with me outside and it's, um, and they like do too much. I mean, you know, the, between the Copaiba, the Agilis, the BLM, the giving them Ningxia, extra sulfurzyme, um, did I say Copaiba and, um, our CBD. I mean, it's awesome. And if you want a nice cocktail of CBD with dogs, add frankincense and Copaiba really good. And if it is a pain thing, muscle bone, like you will knock that out and help and support that like within a week. Okay. It wasn't happening. And so I have a great holistic vet. So we were doing, um, you know, chiropractic and acupuncture and adding herbs and it wasn't moving the needle and it was, and progressively we just learned that about this lesion, um, on his spinal cord. I am telling you the only thing that would keep this dog out of pain and if you've ever taken a one-on-one class with anybody, they probably have told you that our, our oils kind of like you get used up by the body in around two hours, right? You've probably heard that before. On the dot, I would give him a raindrop treatment and he would be pain-free. So he, he was showing me pain just by whimpering and kind of crying and he would want me to lay with him. And um, I'm going to cry because it was almost a year ago. Um, but on the dot, I would give him a raindrop and it would take him out of pain. That was the only thing. And I even had a script from our conventional doc for like some high end pain meds for him. And, um, they didn't touch it. It was the raindrop that, that helped him. And it was like every two hours around the clock. Yeah. His last few days. So crazy, crazy, crazy. So much goodness. We are power tools work. They are so awesome. So I want you to have faith in that. Um, okay. So, um, I have more stories, but I'm going to wrap up my stories right there for the moment and tell you a couple of things. So I want to give you a couple of references that are really, really good. Um, actually, let me grab really quick my barn kit and I think I can put it in the, ch the files in the chat, or if not, I will send that on to you. It was usually right here on my desktop. Where did you go? Let me see, barn kit. I'll send it to Shannon. I don't know why it's like, you know, it's like hiding on the mo at the moment. I'll send it to you. But it's a whole list of things that you want to have as your go-tos in your barn. Okay. So that will be one resource for you. Another resource. And I did just check be the today before I got on here, it, it's still available. $50 investment. Go get this book. This is the animal desk reference. It is on animal, um, life science publishing. It's really good. Um, if you've never looked at it or never have gone through it, it is organized by species. So say you have a dog, you can go through here and it's gonna give you all kinds of tips and tricks on what you can use um, for, you know, like I open it up here. It's like 
from emotions to um, cruciate ligament tears to kennel cough to kidney disease, it's going to by species kind of break it down for you because it, it does matter a little bit. You know, what you do for um, dogs might not be the same thing you do for horses or birds or cats. There's a little tweaks there. Um, but that is, if you have animals and you want a resource, definitely grab that. Um, the, something that I have done is I have my little book. So this is oils and horsonality. Um, but what I have done in here is put some recipes that I personally love. And there's also some things around for, um, emotions in here because, um, you know, because of my training background, I have a little bit different of a level of understanding of animals and how I use my oils and things with them. And so I put together this mini book. It's, I don't know how many pages it is, but uh, a bunch of my favorite, um, favorite recipes for fly sprays. So that's that. So that's another thing. If you want that, um, you can reach out to me and that is, I'm going to do a special for you tonight for five bucks if anybody wants that. So let me know. Um, let me see what else am I forgetting? And then I will open up for your questions and anything you would like to ask. What do you use for fleas and ticks? Okay. For, for everybody, it's kind of really the same. Um, so there are, we have a ton of um, oils that work against flea and, fleas and ticks, including um, including our the stuff that's ready made, like our insect repellent, the wipes and and that. So one of my more favorite things to do is um, I like to get the little stainless steel spray bottles, and I will put like a squirt of our insect repellent in there because I also like the fact that it has a carrier oil in there. So when you spray it on the hair, this is I'm talking for like your dogs. Um, it's the same for the horses, but on a bigger level. Um, and then I love things like Kunzia purification, rosemary, lavender um, purification, Melrose. I'm looking at my oil shelf, peppermint lemongrass. What I do is I just go over to my oil shelf because I have almost every oil and I just hold my jar and just go, yep, that's good. That's good. And I go through all the different oils and add a few of um, all the ones that, you know, ticks and bugs don't like. And then I top that off with witch hazel or water um, for my horses. Um, a tip from one of my upline was actually to make a big, strong vat of um, catnip tea. And so, and use that as your carrier, like your water and your solution. And that works really good. Um, if you have horses and you're a trail rider, I honestly will like spray my horses down um, with my, my homemade fly spray. And then I will um, carry an oil with me. And that works famously. I'll also use like the carry the um, baby wipes with you because those are great for, um, flies like the lavender in there. Most mosquitoes and things don't really love. I, you can tie those onto your halter or your bridle, and then you can put extra oils like right onto those. That's really helpful. Um, so yeah, um, mange on dogs. Um, so mange is like, is also, it's an internal thing as well. It's an external thing. Lots of times, um, the animals need, um, internal gut support. And so I would be sourcing things like the, our life nine, our sulfur zyme. I might even find a good source of taurine for that because that's an extra, um, amino acid. You can use our amino wise, a big, um, um, a big support on that, that I might even call in paraphrase on that again. And then topically, if they're, um, again, you're just like toning down and trying to soothe that itch. So it's going to be things like tea tree. It's going to be things like purification, um, things that are soothing geranium to really help soothe that itch. And so that it's not spreading. Let's see. Um, I was wondering about something to repel ticks and fleas for cats. So remember how I said cats like to lick everything off? I would um, think about making them a collar, um, like make your own collar, or you can go on Amazon or search this, like they're actually doing this. Make them a collar where the oils will actually, um, um, you know, like those, what are that, what's that called, Shannon? Like the, where it sucks into it, uh, the lava stone or whatever. So that you're not putting like tons of flea and tick oils on your cat. I would make them a collar that absorbs the oils. And then you can just add that, add more to that every day or 
every week or whatever the need is. Um, well, lots of questions here. Hang on, hold up, got to scroll back. Um, yes, I talk about horse warmer in my book. Um, lice on goats, baby goats. Um, yes. So you can use the same things on. So again, go to the gut, whether it's um, lice on people or lice on animals, there's still a gut connection. If you have healthy, oxygenated, happy gut and body, these parasitic things are going to be less likely to want to feast on blood. Parasitic yucks like unhealthy blood. I like can't stress that enough. Ningxia, ningxia, ningxia. Um, and then topically rosemary, lavender, peppermint, repeat, tea tree, you know, all those oils that are just hair. Like you'll see them today called like a mermaid spray. All these crazy, like cliche, silly cutie names, like they actually do shit. So sorry. <laughs> so go find those things. And that's um, what you'll use chickens. Okay. How I take care of there's like chickens are vast. Um, I have chickens. When I clean my chicken coop, I like to put cedar shavings in there and I put um, oils like oregano and thyme in the wood chips. Um, this time of year when my like oregano and thyme is really big and bushy. Hazel, Hazel. Um, I'll actually cut some of my herbs off and throw that in there with it. Let me just grab her because come here, Hazel, here, come here. You're okay. Come here. Good girl. You're okay. She, my, here's my driveway dinger and thinks she has to, but it's just my husband. Um, this is my puppy. She's like not so little anymore, but this is my puppy, Hazel. She's so cute. <laughs> Um, so, okay. So yeah. So with chickens, you can do that. You can put some of those oils in their water too. I love apple cider vinegar and water for chickens. Thyme and oregano are, are big ones. Um, easy. You guys, lemon, another easy, easy one for chickens. Um, for cats, would you spray the mix on them? I think I talked about that. Put it on a little collar for them. Um, one of my cats has a sore on his back. What's his name? Okay, so anytime you're, anytime we use antibiotics and steroids on us or our um, animals, you have now signed up for a year of gut health rebuilding. Okay, not saying that out of a judgment judgmental way, um, but I, I I need that to be in your mind so that you are realistic about your goals and end game here. Um, so. Yep. I mean, all the things you're saying is so that that cat really needs some internal health boost. And once you fix again, and I would be putting things like helichrysum on it that are super gentle, um, a little bit of animal sense ointment and just watch it, make sure it's not, um, you know, going and like eating and licking too much of it off. Um, because it's not going to like hurt it. It might, you know, it just might not feel good if it does that. Um, but again, it's like getting to the root of the, of the problem. And when you fix the gut, even like for your wrinkles, you guys, you got to get some goodness in your gut. Like you got to get the collagen, like BLM and taking vitamin C. It's like that goodness comes from the out the inside out. Like everything that's happening on the skin, you can start working on from the gut and from the inside. Um, okay. How much apple cider vinegar, how much water, you, you know what, play with it. Like my chickens get like a five gallon pail and I just do a little splash in there. Um, I'm an extrovert, you guys, I don't measure very often. Go for it, do it. BLM is our supplement called bone ligament muscle. So did I answer that? Cool. Anybody, you're welcome to come off mute and chat or ask any questions you like. I'm wondering what you, um, oh, sorry, I'm orange here for the moment. Um, I'm wondering a, a story or what you use for emotions. Um, do you, do you address emotions of anxiety, stress, trauma with your oils and animals? Yes. Oh my gosh. It's actually kind of crazy because, um, they are even more receptive to the, the oils for emotions. Like we're kind of like in our head, you know, and it's like, sometimes, you know, we introduce the oils to us and all of our baggage comes out where animals are so pure. And, you know, what I tend to do, um, again, you can like go low and slow, but you know, if you have a very highly sensitive animal, a dog, cat, horse, you can put the oils on you before you even put them on them. You can even just like have them in your house at first. You can like open the cap and put a drop on the rug. You know, you can just like 
put them in influence the atmosphere before you like go to them. And then um, something that I have seen to be true with the horses is like, you know, if you hold up a bottle and like, I just allow them to smell it. And it's interesting because if they smell from the left nostril, it's usually a physical need. If they smell from the right nostril, it's usually an emotional need. So, um, and often and times you have to let them, like if you take it for horses, if you put oils on your hands, and they want it, they will like lick your hands. They'll try to eat the bottle. You have to be very careful. And if they don't want it, they'll back, they'll like lean back or back up. Um, they're very telling and, you know, dogs too, and cats too, I've noticed, you know, um, very, very telling. So. <laughs> Anybody else have a last minute question? Hi. Jeannie, you'll need to unmute yourself or I'll put it in the chat. Okay, go ahead. Yes, Laura. Oh, hi. I had a question about spraying on animals, like introducing the oil. If you have it in a spray bottle, are they going to be more likely to say like, no, because it's a spray bottle or like, you just put it on your hands, put it on you. Because I'm just thinking if you mix up something and have it in a spray bottle, I don't um, know. That was my thought. You know what? There's some training that can go along with that. I mean, my dogs mm -hmm. are wiggly and happy, happy go lucky. Like I just grab the spray bottle and spray them on them and they might wiggle with it, but it's not a negative experience for them. And most of the time they just stand there like, yep, I'm getting sprayed. We're going outside. Um, horses is when they're younger and they're training or just green in their training. It's definitely a training process. So instead of wasting your oils for a horse, you might take a bottle of water and spray get them used to being sprayed off with a spray bottle before you spray them with your oils. So yes. um, it's a training process. Yeah, when you introduce them, do you put it on your hands or on you? When you when you put it on you and, and present it to your animal, is it more likely to just be better if it's like that? Yeah, just put it on you. Yep, and try not to yeah. you know, judge it and make it a big deal. Just give it a try, yeah. give it a go. Yeah, okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, come on in. I put a question in the chat, but after I typed it, I thought she can't answer that because it won't be compliant. Oh, uh, <laughs> my dog is having some issues now. And uh, the question had to do with eucalyptus. Would eucalyptus work to support any breathing issues, do you think? It's worth a try. I absolutely would. Yeah, I had a friend who was, who literally was visiting a conventional vet weekly for, she had a, um, she with her cat weekly with her cat for some breathing issues and started and she did two things. Um, one of them was she got a better water because she lives in, she was on city water. And so she got a Berkey to filter her water and she started diffusing respiratory specific oils. And within a couple of weeks, the change was more dramatic than the two years that she spent weekly at the vet. My dog likes to lick the water off the deck when it's rained and I just cringe because my deck's, it hasn't been sealed recently, but three or four years ago it was sealed. It's got all those chemicals on it. And, but he likes, he'd rather lick that off than drink the water in the house. Oh, interesting. You know, some, he might be telling you something. He might be looking for some minerals, maybe um, offer him. And you gotta be careful around with supplements, like try to find a whole food supplement or offer him some Ningxia or some Sulfurzyme. Um, Every kibble, every dog kibble, every horse food that is um, like made on a big scale, they add in a synthetic mineral blend. It's just what the industry does, but it's synthetic and our bodies can't tolerate that and break that down in a, in a, in a way like, you know, you might, it might be good. And if you're a horse person or a livestock person, what is classic in the industry is somebody jumps to a new feed and guess what? The mineral is different in that one. And the horses come and look bloom and look great. And in a couple of months, they look like junk again. So they jump to the next feed and they're like, wow, they look so wonderful again. And they're just like mineral hopping. And, um, but again, you come to a point where the horses are kind of like enough. I can't like, I can't sustain this anymore. So back to Ningxia, back to Sulfurzyme, back to real stuff. If you do see him licking that, I would take a capsule and fill it with some or, um, digize and try to help him move that through. Thank you. Yep. Lisa. Oh my gosh, that made me so excited to hear you talk about, oh, 
Did I miss something? Are we there? <laughs> Not sure. Lisa Benham, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. It was, and I got so intrigued by what she was talking about, I forgot what I was going to ask. Okay. <laughs> no worries. You can connect with Molly. Um, Molly, tell them how to find you, how to connect with you, if they've got other questions or they want your horse um, oils and horsonality book. Yeah. Um, Instagram or Facebook is easy, or I can even like, if, if that's not an option for you, um, reach out to Shannon. If you know how to get hold of Shannon, she can connect us. Um, but yeah, I'm on both of those places and my name is just like she spelled it. So I'm I remembered both. what I was going to ask. Okay. Do you have, um, uh, you keep talking about making your own food. Do you have like resources for how to make, like if I were to make cat food, Ooh, um, so something about cats is that um, I do like a I do like a vet. Her name is she's deceased now, but her name is Pat Colby, C O L E B Y, and you can find her books on Amazon. They're super old, um, but she has some really good stuff on there. Um, there's a whole bunch. If you on, if you just go on Amazon and look up a book about raw feeding, there are several. But the biggest difference between dogs and cats and raw feeding is that cats, you must feed them fresh. They will not tolerate anything that's been sitting out or anything like that. Dogs, you can like leave it on the counter for three days and they'll still eat it and be fine. So they must have fresh. If you can go to your local butcher and get like some chicken necks, lots of times cats like chicken necks um, or little pieces of chicken with the raw bone in them. So um, feeding raw is sounds simple, but it's not always easy. Honestly, it's about finding your rhythm of how to do it. So, you know, finding where you're going to source it from the container, how you store it in the refrigerator makes a difference because that's going to make your system and um, rhythm around it more full of ease. Um, and then just do it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're at, um, the end of our time here. So Molly, thank you a million times. I, You're so I knew that you knew a lot about animals and that was not a surprise, even though it was very awe-inspiring. But one thing that I have as a takeaway from today is our products are really super powerful and we're underutilizing them in probably every scenario. So to hear your stories and the confidence that you have in those products is really awe-inspiring and gives me a lot of hope and kind of a, a little swift kick to step it up a notch in, in my world with my family and my, my animals. So thank you for giving your time and sharing your expertise. Any last words before we all sign off? No, thank you. I'm so honored to be here and just do it. You guys experiment, just get, get unfearful, go for it. <laughs> awesome. So this will be recorded and placed on our YouTube channel, which is believe team library, I believe is what it's called. And I can send you the link uh, for that. And then you can share it with other people. Um, so anyway, thank you all so much for coming, Molly. This was a real treat and hope to see you all soon. Good night.